This is session seven, Beholding the God of Love. We're going to take several sessions and look at different aspects of our great God so we can begin to, be, uh, to see that he is indeed more than enough. A.W. Tozer said, the most important thing about you is what you know to be true about God. And I think that is really true. You know, all of us um, who have grandchildren and, and, and children and friends, we, we might carry around some... Uh, uh, the pictures in our wallets, and if, if you want to see what my grandsons look like, you can see me afterwards. We have, li we have little pictures of our, our, our grandchildren and, and so forth, and that's because we, we, want, we want to be able to look at those and show them to other people. Well, in, in a very similar way, all of us have in the wallet of our mind, if I can put it that way, a portrait of what God looks like to us. And if we were to take that picture of God and project him on a screen up here, what your picture of God is, we could pretty well predict your future. We could predict how you are going to handle uh, difficulties in life, how you're going to handle emergencies. We can predict a lot about the stability you're going to have and the joy you're going to have based on what that picture of God looks like. And that picture of God is made up of what we know to be true about him and about his attributes. If that, if that picture is, is uh, fuzzy and uh, underdeveloped, um, it may even be a picture that you don't like and that if other people saw the, God, the picture of God you have in your mind, they might not like him either. And we want to correct that picture of God. I remember when uh, our girls were young, my mom and dad have lived in Greenville here for 20-some uh, uh, years now or more, and uh, dad's been with the Lord for several years. But when the girls were real young, and we'd go over to mom and dad's for uh, supper once a week on Thursday evenings, uh, mom and dad had a huge Siamese cat, I mean a big animal. And um, I've grown up around animals because I grew up on a farm, but my daughters had not grown up around animals. They were terrified of this cat. And, um, you know, I, I guess, you, you know, when you're three and four and, you know, you're just a few feet off the ground and this, this animal comes up to you who, you know, comes a little above your knees or whatever, it's pretty foreboding. And then somebody tells you to pet the kitty. You know, that's kind of like you and me meeting a full-grown lion and somebody saying, well, go ahead and pet the kitty. And we're saying, are you kidding? You know, I think that's kind of what they felt like. And in fact, his, his mom and dad had a gravel driveway in the place they lived at that time. And, and as soon as our tires would hit the gravel, they would just kind of go into alert mode and they would say, is Tinkerbell in the house? <laughs> they did not want to go in the house if Tinkerbell was in the house. In fact, they didn't even want to take it by faith. They wanted to see him outside. They were so petrified of that cat. Now, the, the only time they would not be afraid of that cat is if I took that cat and put it in my lap and held it for them. Then they would come over very gingerly and they would reach out and, and, and just kind of this kind of thing and just barely touch it. And then they would get all excited and say, Mommy, Mommy, I pet the kitty, I pet the kitty. And they would get so excited. Now, what made them feel safe with that cat now? Well, it had something to do about their father. And it wasn't just my size. They could see very clearly that daddy's bigger than the cat. And if they got into a match, now that's a lot of faith that I could probably beat the cat. I don't know, you know, maybe the cat would kill me before I killed it. I don't know. But, um, but you know, at least I was bigger than the cat, and they felt like I probably could uh, protect them from the cat. But it was not my size, it was not my power that made them feel safe in those times because my father could put the cat in his lap and say, come pet the kitty, and they wouldn't do it. Now, they could see that grandpa's bigger than the cat, but at three and four years of age, they did not yet know how much their grandfather loved them and would protect them, too, with that power. So, see, it's not enough just to know that God is powerful. That's, that's no comfort, folks, if you don't think he likes you. It is an understanding of his love that puts our hearts at rest. And if you ask a lot of Christians, do you think God loves you? They will say, well, well you know, yeah, he loves me. He, you know, he died on the cross for me. Um, and yet they, they, will not, they will not settle down and rest in their heart. Because they really don't know his love in a way that is truly helpful. In Romans 8, 31 to 32, the passage in front of you says, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? 
He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And as I said, most of us don't have any trouble seeing that God is powerful. We just aren't sure that he loves us. I saw a title on a book in a, in a teenage devotional session, a section of a, uh, of a Christian bookstore one time. It said, if God loves me, why can't I get my locker open? Well, you know, we think about that in a lot of, if, if God loves me, why do I hurt so much? And if God loves me, why isn't my marriage working? And if God loves me, why can't I get lasting victory over sin? If God loves me, why did mom die? If God loves me, why do I have cancer? If God loves me, why don't I have a spouse? If God loves me, why can't I pay the bills? Well, those are all problems that we can run into. And an understanding of the love of God will have a lot to do with how well we go through those trials. And no man can have a genuinely God-taught contentment about his life who has not seen the love of God for him. I think this is why Paul in Ephesians 3 prayed that God would open the eyes of people that they would understand the length and the breadth and the depth and know the love of Christ that passeth knowledge. Now, why would Paul have to pray that folks would understand the love of God if it was, if it was just natural to understand it? It isn't commonplace. And we ought to be praying, God, open my eyes to your love. Help me to see your love. Well, what is the essence of God's love? What is it? Love is really a subset of his goodness. If we look at God's attributes and divide them uh, in two parts, we have uh, the God's greatness and God's goodness. Love is a subset of his goodness. And we use the word good in a couple of different ways, and both of these apply to God in this respect. That God is good means that God is excellent. We use the good in that sense. We might say, wow, she is really a good employee. Now, what do we mean by that? We mean that by all of the ways we measure good employees, she answers to that ideal. She is a great, good, she is a good employee. Or we say, that was a wonderfully good supper. Now, what do we mean by that? We mean that, boy, when you take into account everything that has to go into a good supper being good, the way it tastes and the way it looks and all that stuff, that meets it right there. That was a good supper. Or, um, boy, you're just a really good child right now, or because that may change, but, you know, right now. Um, because at the moment, with whatever answers to the ideal of being a good child, you're doing it right now. Well, you know what, folks? God is a good God in this respect, that he answers perfectly to the ideal of everything that goes into being God. He is good in that way. That means that he is excellent. Now, if you don't know what a perfect creator looks like, or should look like, then you won't have any idea whether he's really measuring up to being good or not. Now, let me give you an illustration. We had a girl numbers of years ago at the university. I'll call her Shannon. That wasn't her real name, but I'll call her Shannon. Shannon grew up in a very, very wealthy family. She had a nanny all of her life, a live-in nanny, a nurse who took care of her and who, um, who ironed all of her clothes, set her clothes out every night for the next morning, who helped her get dressed the next morning, who fixed her hair, um, who went shopping with her, who took care of all of these kinds of things, bought all her cosmetics for it, all those sorts of things. And when she came to Bob Jones, she didn't have a clue about how to handle things by herself. She thought that a good roommate would do those things for her. Her idea of a good roommate was somewhat flawed because there wasn't anybody else in the room who had that same sense that that's what a good roommate was to be. Now, fortunately, and, and there were some real ripples at the very beginning because she didn't know how to curl her hair and she was waiting for the girls to free themselves up so they could help her curl her hair and things like that. And, and, and I mean, she wasn't just trying to be nasty. She just thought this is other folks exist to help you. Well, fortunately, she had a very godly spiritual leader in the room who understood her problem and did a lot of those things for her as a way to build bridges to her to be able to begin to earn the trust to deal with her heart and help that girl a lot. 
But see, that girl was really dissatisfied and disgruntled about all of the roommates because she didn't have an idea of what a truly good roommate looked like. She had other expectations for that roommate other than what was true about a good roommate. Now, we have some expectations about God. And unless we understand exactly what he's supposed to be like, we'll kind of think maybe he's not doing a good job. But you know what, folks? God comes through with an A++ in being God. And he answers perfectly to the ideal of what it means to be a God. And our problem is we don't know him well enough or the way he works well enough. And sometimes we give God poor grades. And we think he's not coming through. And God hasn't messed up. He is the same excellent, perfect God all along. We just, are not, we just don't have a good view of what a good God is supposed to look like. And at the core of every temptation is the unbelief that God is not enough for me. See, that's what Satan did in the very first temptation in the garden. He came and said, you know, God's not really looking out for you. He's not really being good to you. You know that tree, he won't even let you eat that because if you eat that, you'll have the knowledge of good and evil and God's trying to withhold something from you that you ought to have. What did he have to do for them to be tempted? He had to get them discontent with what they had. And he did it by impugning the goodness of God, his love for them. Well, that God is good also means that God is benevolent. That means that he is good for me. Benevolent means good will, making good choices for us. My um, last couple of years of high school were very uh, tumultuous for my mom and dad because I was in great rebellion to God. And I got involved in a lot of things that, that um, I regret. And I did a lot of stealing during that time from my boss, from, my, from businesses in town, from my school, from my friends. And I was playing in a folk rock group, and mom and dad didn't want me in that, and I was sneaking out and doing things. And some nights I didn't come home, and I said, I'm staying with my boss. Sometimes I was staying with my boss. A lot of times I wasn't staying with my boss. And I came to Bob Jones in great rebellion. I didn't want to be at Bob Jones. And I had, um, I didn't, I just wanted to do what I wanted to do, but I had promised them, as I say in a weak moment, that I'd go to a Christian college for a year. So I came to Bob Jones. And I remember one night, after God had gotten a hold of my heart, and I'd repented of those things, and I got right with mom and dad, I wrote them a letter. Mom, some years ago, gave me the letter that I wrote, asking them for forgiveness for those things. And I remember after that was unfolding, and God was just, doing wonderful things in my heart. I got off work and I was, staying, I was walking across campus and I stood on the bridge of nations and the thought occurred to me I shouldn't be in Bob Jones. I should be in jail for stealing and that kind of thing. And it struck me there's only one reason I'm here and that's because there's a God in heaven who loves me. And folks, that makes a whole lot of difference in your life when you begin to realize he really does love us. And I come into that office some days and I see the sign, Jim Berg, Dean of Students, over the door. And I say, God, I'm not good enough to do this. And he reminds me, you're not. You're not here because you've been good. You are here because I'm good. Now, folks, that settles my soul a lot. I can rest in that. If it's up to my performance, I'm in trouble. But if it's up to him, I'm safe. That God is good means that he is benevolent. He's good to us. Psalm 107, the psalmist mentions this, O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed out of the hand of the enemy. And on through that psalm, verse 8, he again says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness. We're talking about his love, which is a subset of this goodness. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness for his, and for his wonderful works to the children of men. 
Verse 15, the same stands, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works for the children of men. And it talks between every one of those stanzas about something Israel did and how they got into trouble and God chastened them and they cried unto the Lord and he delivered them and brought them back. And then it says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, for his marvelous works to the children of men. And then they did this and they fell into sin here and God chastened them and they cried out in their despair and he came and delivered them. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness. He's always good, folks. And you come to those last two verses in that, in that chapter. It says, The righteous shall see it and rejoice. And all iniquity shall stop her mouth. And then notice this, this verse. Whoso is wise and will observe these things, if you will take the time to observe how many times you have failed God and how many times you've cried out to him and he has forgiven you and you've failed him and you've cried out and he's forgiven you. He says, if you will take the time to observe these things, even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. He is good. God's love is his personal communication to a rational creature of his benevolence by giving himself for the highest good of that creature. Love is a self-sacrificing choice to meet the genuine needs of another. And folks, we must meditate upon these truths and argue ourselves back to reality. We start on the way down when we listen to ourselves and complain about God instead of studying these things and talking to ourselves about what God is really like. And I'll say more about that when we get into talking about despair. What is the extent of God's love? How vast is it? Paul, Paul prayed that we would be able to comprehend the length and breadth and depth and know the love of Christ that passeth knowledge. Well, a couple of things I just want you to think about, and I hope you take this and meditate on it much, but number one, you cannot do anything that will cause him to love you more. And some Christians, bless their hearts, are trying to do right so that God will like them more. People, he loves us with a, with a perfect love. You can't get any better than perfect love. He can't love you and he can't love me any more than he already does. He loves us with perfect love. And some of us are trying so hard to do right, to do everything. If God would just love me and then he'll answer my prayers and, and, this, and that maybe he'll bless me. And, it, and it's, and it's kind of like the mentality like this. When... When my daughters used to come home from nursery school, they used to bring artwork like this. Y'all see that? They used to bring artwork like this. And, they would, and they would, when we'd pick them up at the nursery or, or at uh, K4 or K5 for lunch, and they would be waving this and say, Daddy, 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 look what I made for you. You know, and you're real excited because they made something for you, and, and, and uh, you, you, know, you want to be honest about it. And so you say, Honey, that's really colorful, because it's always colorful. You know, or, or honey, I can tell you really tried, you know, whatever. And then comes this penetrating question. Daddy, will you take this and hang it in your office? Well, now what are you going to do with that? So I thought, well, I, I tell you what, honey. The people who love you the most live in, in this house. So let's hang it on the refrigerator right in the middle of our house where the people who love you the most can see it anytime they want to see it. Okay, okay, you know, we take it home and put it on the refrigerator. So here's a daddy who is praising this artwork. Is he doing it because this artwork is just so stunning, it just elicits spontaneous praise for its art? No. This artwork gets commendation because there's a daddy's heart that loves a little girl who's doing the best she can. And one day I want to hear Jesus Christ say to me, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I want to hear that so bad I can taste it. But I tell you folks, when I die, no matter how holy I try to be on this earth, when I die, there's not going to be this holy hush over heaven. And they all whisper to one another, Berg is here. Berg is here. Let's go see this thing which has come to pass. <laughs> this is not going to happen. Look folks, I can be as holy as I know how to be, but they're used to looking on holiness on a scale I can't even imagine, let alone duplicate. And when I hit heaven, and if I hear well done from my father, it isn't because my godliness is so stunning. They just don't know what to do with that up there. But because there's a father who loves me. 
and wants to encourage a son who tried with his help. See, folks, you can't perform enough to get well enough to get God to like you. This is the best you can do. This doesn't hang in the Louvre. It hangs on refrigerators. And your works and my works, even my prayers have to be laundered before they're pleasing to God. My works don't impress him. The only thing that impresses him is his work. And when we allow him to do his work through us, whether it's our prayers or our preaching or our witness or our smiles or our helps, that's what is gold and silver and precious stone and it's enduring because he did it. The stuff we do just burns up. And bless your heart, some of you are trying to get God to like you and he loves you with an everlasting love now. You can't get him to love you more. And you know what else? You can't get him to love you any less than what he loves you because he loves you with a perfect love. I think the only time most of us Christians gamble is when we buy a car. When we buy a car, we think we're knowing, we know what we're getting, but we don't, especially if you're buying a used car. Even a new car has all these recalls. And we, we buy this car and we think, well, you know, it was used and it's four years old or ten years old or whatever, and I expect it to have a little, so when a problem comes up, we kind of expect it, but we just wish it didn't. But we don't know what's coming up. But you know what, folks? When God bought you and when he bought me and when he chose us, he knew what he was getting. Because he knew us from our conception to the time of our death when we stand before him and he knows everything that happens in between, even the stuff you and I have not yet found out about ourselves that we might do. Did you know he knows that too? And while it may surprise us to mess up in some way, it isn't any surprise to him. And he bought us knowing all of that. And the fact that we do it doesn't change anything about it because he knew that when he chose us. You can't do anything to get him not to love you. This is an enormously stabilizing truth, folks. Enormously stabilizing. And if, the, just the, if, if somebody comes to you in a time of turmoil and says, don't forget the love of God for you. If that doesn't quiet your heart, that's just like looking at a file folder with a tab on it that says love of God and there's nothing in the folder. You don't know what's really here because you haven't meditated on the truths that teach that. Jeremiah 31, 3 the Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love, and with loving kindness have I drawn thee. And God commended his love. He demonstrated his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What is the evidence of God's love? The most notable expression of God's goodness and his love is Calvary. 1 John 4, 9 says, And this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. I remember one time, several years ago, I was reading through the New Testament and I came to Galatians 6, 14, where Paul says, But God forbid that I should boast, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I remember thinking, There's something I don't understand here because I'm not, the first thought of my heart is not, God forbid that I should boast save in the cross. I mean, I, I have a lot of respect for God and I have a lot of devotion to God, but I don't have this sense of the cross like Paul had of the cross. I thought, God, I, I have to know this. And I cleared away a Saturday and I got alone and I said, God, I'm going to study Isaiah 53 about this cross until you show me something about it that makes me have this same sense that God forbid that I should boast save in this cross. And I spent the morning reading Isaiah 53, memorizing it again, looking up other verses about it, looking up commentaries on it, all the while praying, God, show me what is so important about this cross that would have this kind of impact on my life. And a little bit early in the afternoon, 
he opened my eyes. And I saw that he was wounded for my transgressions. Now, I knew that before, but I hadn't seen it like this, that he was wounded for my transgressions, and he was bruised for my iniquities, and the chastisement of my peace was upon him, and with his stripes I was healed. And all I could do was break into song. And then as Tozer says, the song breaks down under the burden of the glory and all you can do is weep in your thanksgiving to see the love of God for us. And it's Calvary. And that's why we say, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain? Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? We sing loved with everlasting love, led by grace, that love to know. Spirit breathing from above, thou hast taught me it is so. Or we sing, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner Condemned unclean, how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How wonderful, how marvelous is my Savior's love for me. Is that the testimony of your heart? If not, that's probably why you're anxious. That's probably why you're despairing. Probably why you're filled with anger. This love is a stabilizing thing in our lives. Oh, love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in. Do you see that? Oh, love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. And I am finding out the greatness of thy loving heart. And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art. This is our God, folks. After Calvary, let it forever be a blasphemy that God does not love. Isn't it interesting that there is more said about God's love in the scriptures than any other aspect of his nature? And yet when we get into trouble, it's the first thing about him we doubt. And that shows you the perverseness of the human heart. Because after this Calvary, there shouldn't be any doubt, any doubt who loves. And he is touched with the feelings of our infirmity. And I've heard people tell me when I tell them that, that he's touched with this feeling of your infirmity. He knows what it's like, and he's gone through every temptation you have had. And I've had people tell me, yeah, but, but he's God, and he can't sin. That's not fair, because I can. How can you say he understands temptation? A few miles from here is Hartwell Dam. Hartwell Dam is, a, is a, with a reservoir and generators there that uh, generates electricity for this area. Now, the power that comes out of there has some amazing current. And before, it's, before it gets to the walls here in your house and in this church where it comes out 110 volts and, and a few amps, it's stepped down quite a bit. And if you go stick your finger in the, in the socket, I don't encourage that, but if you do that, you'll get a little tingle. If you're standing in some water, you won't feel anything after a couple of seconds. But, um, but uh, you know, you'll get a little tingle. And that's all you'll feel here. When Jesus endured temptation out in the wilderness, he endured temptation, the full force of Satan. You and I get it stepped down. He got it, everything Satan could throw at him, and it says the devil left him alone. You know what that meant? That means he went over to the generator 
And instead of sticking his fingers in a socket and enduring that level of temptation, he went down to the generator, held on to those electrodes with that kind of current, and held on until the generator melted down. Now you tell me who understands temptation. And it is that God who lovingly says, you can come boldly to my throne of grace for mercy and forgiveness and for grace to help in time of need. I understand temptation. I'm touched with the feelings of your infirmity. I love you and I proved it. And that's why I say it should ever, forever be a blasphemy to think that God does not love because he proved that. What are the effects of God's love? What difference does it make? It banishes our fears. 1 John 4 says, Perfect love casteth out fear. For fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. You don't understand this perfect, all-encompassing love for you if you live in fear and anxiety. Because this God who did all of that, he that spared not his own son but delivered him up for his all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? This God is for us. If God be for us, this God is for us. Who can be against us, he says. It compels us to love others as he has loved us. It makes us energetic and enthusiastic. 2 Corinthians 5 says, for the love of Christ constraineth us. This is what motivates us. This is what restrains us this, from everything else and pushes us this direction. The love of Christ constrains us. For we thus judge, or we've made this judgment or come to this conclusion that if one died for all, then we're all dead. He died for all of us because we were all dead. And he died for all that they who now live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him who died and rose again. His love is a compelling thing for us inspires true worship. In Revelation 5, they're singing to this lamb who is slain to redeem all, out of all tribes and kindreds and nations. Why? Because he loved us. That's an amazing thing, folks. And you know what? It's not just that God loves sinners. He loves me. And he loves you. And my soul can rest because God's love is more than enough for me. That needs to be the prayer of our hearts, the statement of our heart, the belief of our heart. My soul can rest because God's love is more than enough for me. What, what does 2 Peter 1, 2 say again? Grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. What do we need to know about him? One thing we need to know is how much he loves. It isn't just that he has loved us. He has loved us in the past and he loves us now. It is an everlasting love. That is an amazing thing. Folks, if you're afraid of the cat, you don't understand well the one who's holding it. And we need to know our God better. And as Psalm 34, 8 says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him.